Just a bit of breaking news, as we were recording today's Daily Tea, I found myself the subject of a headline. The headline is, Tommany dropped from chairing Tory leadership Q&A following candidate complaint. Now, I think I told you that I was going to be doing the fireside chats with the four contenders to the Tory throne at the Tory party conference in Birmingham next week. I'm no longer doing that. Apparently, one of the candidates did not want to receive the Tommany treatment. I can't think why. As you know, we have questioned them fairly, if robustly, on the Daily Tea. I've given them similar treatment on my GB News show. I'm not sure if this is a case. I'm not sure if this is a case of one of the candidates being frit. I did give Robert Jenrick a bit of a going over uh, on my show on Sunday. I've interviewed Tom Tugendhat. Asked him if he was too wet to win. Maybe that's a bit awkward. I've also asked Kemi Badenoch, you know, are you just too rude and abrasive to be the next Conservative leader? And indeed, I've asked James Cleverly whether he has got the stature to take to replace Rishi Sunak. I don't know whether it's that. Maybe they think that I'm too much of a Kemi fangirl. Uh, I'm not sure what it's all about, but basically I've been unceremoniously dumped. The good news, however, is I've got more time to spend on recording exclusive content for this podcast. So as the hunt continues for the candidate who couldn't contend with the idea of being interviewed by me, we shall be bringing you all the very latest from the Birmingham Tory party conference next week. Well, Tim, at last we have the admission that Telegraph readers have probably been waiting for, let's be honest, because they were lockdown sceptic. It's Chief Medical Officer Professor Sir Chris Whitty admitting to the COVID inquiry that the government did overdo it, at least in the early days of the pandemic. Yep, it strikes me that the COVID inquiry is not going the way many expected. Uh, Many people have felt that it was weighted to prove that Britain should have locked down sooner and harder, but one witness after another seems to be slowly proving the lockdown critics right. So we're going to be re-entering the lockdown debate... (laughs) (laughs) Goodness help us both. But don't despair because we will also be lightening the mood in this Daily Tea because we've got Telegraph Big Beast. I hope he doesn't mind us describing him as that. Simon Heffer, who is our resident wordsmith. He's going to be in the studio to discuss why language matters. And genuinely stay tuned because his interpretation of Gen Z slang is a joy to behold. And it's coming up later. Welcome to the Daily Tea with me, Camilla Tomini. And me, Tim Stanley. Tim, we're still talking about COVID. We're still talking about the pandemic. Of course, the inquiry rumbles on, but a significant contribution today by, I suppose we can call him Professor Lockdown, along with Sir Patrick Valance, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, who has now disappeared back into obscurity, but was a major feature on our television screens every day and night during 2020 and 2021. Let's not overblow this because he has said something pretty careful Mm. okay this isn't you know some revelation that Whittier said oh lockdowns were all a mistake yeah but what he has said seems to indicate that he felt the government's initial reaction to the pandemic was overdone let's listen to precisely what he told the inquiry earlier worried at the beginning I still worry actually in retrospect about did did we get the level of uh, concern right? Were we either over-pitching it so that people were incredibly afraid of something where, in fact, their actuarial risk was low, or were we not pitching it enough and therefore people didn't realise the risk they were walking into? I think that balance is really hard, and arguably... Uh, Some people would say uh, we, if anything, overdid it rather than underdid at the beginning. I'm just saying that there's a certainly there's a range of opinions on that. So he's really talking about messaging there, that he worries that the message may have overdone it at the beginning, that maybe I, I interpret that to mean we were scaring people too much. So if anyone then says, so he's not really questioning lockdown, I would reply half of lockdown was the messaging. Mm. It was about trying to shape human behavior. And then the policy followed the messaging because the policy had to keep up with the perception of the risk. But here's the rub. Reflecting on it now, you're dealing with the British, Mm. okay? We're very good at following rules generally. I know we have exceptions and riots and goodness knows what, but on the whole, we obey, we comply, we cue. 
there's this massive project fear going on. I mean, you remember those first days? I remember my village being completely deserted, mm. had situations where people were wearing face masks outside and crossing you in an open field, keeping their distance. People were absolutely terrified initially. Yeah. And then that calls into question if the psychology of it all was so strongly in favor of people doing what they were told, staying indoors and saving the NHS, why we actually needed all the measures to be so draconian yeah. when probably we'd have all followed and complied with even far less serious sort of COVID in interventions. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll get into what specific witnesses have said that has slowly challenged the narrative we were sold at the time. But the, the, the perception of risk and danger was framed by statistics that we, yeah. were, we were given of extraordinary numbers of people dying. It was imagery we were given of, a ho of our hospital in Italy and, of course, what little we knew coming out of China. This yeah. is a point that George Osborne made that really we were following China's lead um, and also with the government's own messaging about uh, you know, the, the potential danger. So in, in other words, this, this point about did we overdo it is important because Everything we did was in response to the perception of risk, and we were terrified. Yes. There's some other points that uh, the professor has made here. He's saying that the initial messaging was quite confused, particularly in relation to the use of PPE and face masks for NHS staff. Look, it was confusing, and uh, this was summarised by that parody that Matt Lucas of Little Britain fame put on the internet impersonating Boris Johnson saying, go out, don't go out, stay at home, don't stay at home. Do you remember that? Yes. I mean, it was yes. all a little confusing. Although, reflecting on it, the central message of stay indoors... Yeah. wasn't really lost on anyone. No. He also admitted that the UK postponed extremely important research into other diseases to prioritise COVID. It probably took us two years to get anywhere near back to where we were pre-pandemic. Pre so I'm not saying this was a cost-free move. Well, yeah, tell that to any patient who missed out on an early cancer diagnosis. And he also said that we are in the, quotes, foothills of understanding long COVID. So long COVID still sort of shrouded in a degree of mystery. Mm -hmm. And we have mm -hmm. done stories, let's be perfectly honest. We've done stories on vaccine harm. We've also done stories on people who are still, where are we now? Four years on, mm. suffering the ill effects of it, long COVID. So yeah. that's serious. But back to lockdown. I mean, does have lockdown skeptics like you and I and a lot of the people writing for this newspaper in 2020 yeah. and beyond been vindicated? Or are we being vindicated by this inquiry, Tim? Well, if you speak to the people who run the inquiry, they will say, quite rightly, we are just here to gather evidence and listen to witnesses and then produce an objective conclusion. But critics of the inquiry have said, look, for a start, it's ridiculously long. Mm -hmm. Um, they argue that it's been emotionally weighted in favor of early lockdown, because, early lockdowns, because, for instance, quote unquote, victims of COVID, you know, people who've lost loved ones can attend and they very yeah. often sit there holding up signs. There are also lawyers present who can ask questions who represent, again, the families or, if you like, victims of those who had COVID. Uh, and there's also been a perception that there's an element of politics to the inquiry, because, for instance, Casey Hugo Keith, his critics will say, will sometimes go easy on a Mandarin who is perceived mm. to be pro-lockdown and he'll be very harsh on a politician uh, like Boris Johnson who's perceived to have been very wet on it. So some people feel that the whole thing has been weighted towards becoming an inquiry into why didn't Britain lock down tougher sooner. Well, if that's the case, and I'm not saying it is, but if that were the case, then in the course of putting people in the dock, uh, those people have sometimes said things which have really challenged that narrative of Britain should have locked down sooner harder. So to begin with, perhaps the most significant one was profession, Professor Neil Ferguson, the man who gave us the famous modelling of, of a potential 500 deaths. 500,000 deaths is the worst case scenario. Yeah. He admitted that he had feared that the cure for tackling COVID lockdown could have been worse than, than the disease. He said that globally containment did not work and that the UK never had any significant chance of stopping the infection from entering the country. Mm. Or indeed, he also added stopping the spread. So that suggests COVID was already here. So there was no point shutting the borders and locking everything down. And also, we couldn't necessarily control the spread 
Ergo, it wasn't necessary, perhaps, to lock us all in our homes. But what we now know, despite the protestations of Matt Hancock, Michael Gove, Nicola Sturgeon, Mark Drakeford, who we can all agree were kind of very pro-lockdown, we might describe them in COVID, we might have described them in copy at the time as mm. lockdown zealots or lockdown hawks mm. versus some of the doves. They're all advocating this idea that we locked down too late. But we now know because of all of the evidence presented by the actual pandemic and the way that New Zealand dealt with it, there was no way of closing the border to the to this. Right. There was no way of closing the border to this infection. And New Zealand levels of lockdown, Sweden levels of lockdown, mm -hmm. whatever happened really in the round, people got COVID, some died most survived. And, and who died depends in part upon factors which are country specific like weight, age, quality of health system, specific responses like locking people up in care homes, etc. It wasn't necessarily the overall pandemic. Um, and some of those decisions that were taking like New Zealand to completely shut down had other effects, which again, the inquiry has started to note have not would not properly calculate it at the time. Uh, Sir Patrick Vallon said uh, in front of the inquiry that, quote, uh, the science was there for everyone to see, the economic advice wasn't. So yeah. in other words, all the talk was about death and medicine, the talk wasn't about economic consequences. Mm -hmm. One person who was raising concerns about economic con consequences, of course, was Boris Johnson. But he was shouted down in part by people who relied upon the statistical information of people like Ferguson. And they did that in part because, and this is something which has sort of emerged from the inquiry, people don't understand statistics. That a statistic can say this is the worst case. Now, if you ask a statistician, just tell me what's the worst thing that can happen. They will mm -hmm. tell you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. Do you know what? I'm just thinking about the politics of this just as we are both uh, recovering from the Labour Party conference in Liverpool. Mm. One of the reasons that Labour is having to blame 14 years of Tory failure for everything that they're now having to contend with, NHS waiting lists, that's been blamed on the Tories' mismanagement of the health service, the economy, it's all the Tories' fault. They've left a £22 billion black hole in our economy. Um, even sort of the state of broken Britain, mm. mental health catastrophe, uh, problems with young people in schools. They're blaming the Tories. And I suppose if COVID hadn't have happened, Keir Starmer would probably have blamed Brexit. And I'm not saying that it isn't in part the Tories' fault, because I think we can agree that successive governments mismanage things terribly. But they can't really blame COVID, even though COVID is overwhelmingly to blame, not least for the NHS's woes right now, mm. because they wanted to lock down harder, sooner and faster. Mm. And therefore, they haven't got a leg to stand on. But you and I know that the aftermath of COVID has been absolutely catastrophic for this country. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you said, said yourself blaming COVID. But of course, it's not just blaming COVID. It's blaming lockdown. It, what, what are we talking about when we talk about the impact of COVID? In some cases, of course, we're talking about the legitimate terrible things COVID did to the country and the costs of containing it. But we're also talking about the effects of lockdown. Uh, and this, this inquiry, right now we're about halfway through it, and it's basically been dealing with what should we have done to what should what should we have done to prepare for this unimaginable uh, crisis, which no other country prepared for, except perhaps in East Asia, where they've been living with it. And the second bit is then the lockdown itself. Should we have done it sooner? And I think the I, I would in the round take away from that from what we've seen thus far, we probably couldn't have prepared. And it probably was in which case it probably was already here, in which case some of the steps we took were not justifiable. And there are a couple of quotes, again, coming out of the inquiry, which are related to this. One is the epidemiologist Professor Mark Woolhouse of Edinburgh University, who said, quote, I think it's fair to describe lockdown not as a public health policy, but as a failure of public health policy. In other words, lockdown is what you do when all those other things you know you can do haven't worked. It's a last resort and always should be that in my view. And in her first report, Baroness Hallett, who chairs the um, who chairs the inquiry, has said um, that the imposition of lockdown should be a measure of last resort. Indeed, there are those who would argue that a lockdown should never be imposed. That's not what she's saying, but she's saying, you know, what the inquiry has shown is there's a, a wide range of opinions about whether or not it's, it's valid or useful to impose a lockdown. Mm. It's all very well as well. I think people have sometimes said, oh, well, with the benefit of hindsight, it's all very well saying all this now. 
That is a cogent argument and would be were it not for the fact that plenty of people were questioning it all at the time yeah. and being shouted down. In yes. academic circles, they were being cancelled. Yes. People have very short memories, Tim. Do you remember all that? The professors like Carl Hennigan yeah. and others who put their heads above the parapet to say, hang on a minute, are we considering all of the costs of this? Yes. Only to be told that they were fruitcakes. Yeah. Uh, they were even branded later on as anti-vaxxers simply because they questioned the efficacy of lockdown. Do you remember those, those two doctors in America who talked about washing your hands? And they came out and said, why are you all saying you must constantly wash your hands because there's good germs as well as bad germs. And I remember that was one, that was one of the first moments of lockdown scepticism that I mm. experienced because I watched that and thought, yeah. yeah. When I was a child, I was told, play in the dirt. You, yes. you need to get German measles. I mean, Young. this is making me uncomfortable because I'm a clean freak and I wash my right. hands about 25 okay, times a day. Well, but that's, good for you. I don't get ill much, but I do take that point. I remember Matt mm. Hancock telling me personally that the risk of transmission was only if you spent more than five minutes within two metres of somebody with COVID. Right, right. Okay, so then I was thinking as I was walking around the village, seeing people standing literally half a mile away with a mask on, going, oh, my God, don't come near her. Yeah. That that was a complete fallacy. And it's very interesting that Hancock has not come out of the inquiry well. I think he saw it as an opportunity to rebuild his reputation because he is Mr. Lockdown and he has more or less argued that I think we should have been tougher sooner. And he tried to apologize to the victims and the audience and things mm. like that. And it's all slightly backfired because if you see lockdown through the prism of that man's ego, then it starts to look like a catastrophic <laughs> policy yes. that's based around people who shouldn't have been in charge, who shouldn't have this I much power. I don't think we should ever see anything through the... Uh, no, but he was our health secretary. Matt Hancock's he was our ego. health secretary. Yeah, I know. And there's a bigger question to be asked about what had happened to British government that a man of yeah. such obviously low quality was in charge at mm. such a, a, an important time That's, in our country's history. To be fair, that is a question that we answered comprehensively in the lockdown files, which are still available to view and listen, no, which are still available to view all of those WhatsApp messages on the Telegraph website. Finally, Tim, quick word on mental health. Yeah. I mean, the one thing I didn't um, name in my list of things that Labour is blaming on the Tories, but should perhaps blame on COVID, is this worklessness epidemic yeah. and people who could work not being able to work, which I think certainly is a hangover of people being furloughed, mm. of people taking a step back. I mean, in one hand, people think that on one hand, people think the flexible working revolution is a good thing. It's currently a debate within the Labour cabinet about it. You know, some cabinet ministers saying get back into the office, along with Jeff Be Bezos and Amazon. Jonathan Reynolds, the business secretary, saying, no, there's nothing wrong with not being in the office. All of these rows, again, I think mm. we would have had an evolution towards more remote working. But yeah. Covid gave it rocket fuel. Yeah. I, the two things I took away from lockdown were one, I now see how fascism happens here. I'm not saying lockdown was fascism, not close to it. My point is I can now see how through fear people can allow their governments to imprison them and also to target minorities, those people who didn't like to have the vaccine. Yeah. The other thing I learned from it is that the mental health, that the so-called mental health concern that politicians have is bunk. Because if you really cared about mental health and politicians keep saying it's as important as physical health, if you really thought that, you wouldn't have done lockdown in the way they did it. You wouldn't have done it to kids. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have done it to have the depressed. Schools. Exactly. But the fact that when push came to shove, protecting yourself against a disease was, was thought as being more important than protecting your mental health tells me that I think politicians are talking with a forked tongue on this subject. They're just saying it because they think it's fashionable and it's what people want to hear, but they clearly don't believe it because they triggered one of the greatest mental health crises in our history. Yeah. And one consequence, as you say, is there's a large number of people living with long COVID, Cool, fine, I'm sure that's true. But there's also a significant number of people who are essentially in a kind of psychological off mode and have been since COVID and have never entirely emotionally recovered from the experience. Well, you've spoken about speaking with a forked tongue there, Tim. Let's talk about speaking with a straight tongue. I tell you somebody who speaks very well is Simon Heffer. It's beautiful tongue. Our esteemed <laughs> Telegraph colleague. Now, coming up next, we're going to be discussing his new book with him, Why Language Matters, which words and phrases he detests, and also getting his interpretation of the latest in Gen Z slang. I can't wait to hear this. Welcome back. Now, do you find yourself frustrated, Tim, by the use of American slang in British English? Can I get 
a cup of tea on yeah. the daily tea? Yes. Or are your hackles raised by talk of taking the elevator or corporate speak like going forward or onboarding? Uh. It's cringeworthy, isn't it? <laughs> well, you are not alone because Simon Heffer, the Telegraph's columnist and quite frankly, an institution on this great paper, has been on a years long mission to rid British English of Americanisms, improper prepositions and bad grammar. Kamal and I sat down with Simon earlier this week to talk about his latest book on this very subject. Simon Heffer joins us in the Daily Tea studio. Are you associate editor of this great organ? Simon, is that your official title? Because you've been here on and off for about 30, 40 years? I've been here on and off since 1986. I've been deputy editor and associate editor, but I'm, I'm just a columnist at the moment. Well, I think that's and probably delighted under to be so. understating your prowess here because you are a master <laughs> of language, so much so that you were the orchestrator once of the Telegraph Starbook, available on Amazon. And Kamal remembers some of your missives. I do. Simon, I remember, you know, Simon Heffer, for anyone who doesn't know, of course they should know, is an absolute Telegraph institution. And when I was a slightly younger journalist in the 2010s and early 2000s, uh, Simon's style emails wrapping all of us poor uh, journalists with the latest mistakes we had made in our copy, but always in the most beautiful, humorous way, which landed the point, Simon, without being rude, which was always your talent, I thought. But these were the most witty uh, missives you would receive from the senior people. They all had their own offices. It was mm. all very, very, you know, Back in, in, in the days. days. Back in there's days. proper respect, Simon. What I didn't want was any of my colleagues, whom I love very much, to be ringing with Samaritans that evening because they had been so humiliated by one of these emails. I can tell you how they started or why they started. I was in Paris. Uh, I'd gone there to have dinner with our then ambassador, and a very nice dinner it was too. And I came out of my hotel at about 7.30 in the morning to come back to London to get here in time for editorial conference, thanks to the time difference. And I bought a Daily Telegraph, you could in those days, uh, on the Champs-Élysées, one of those nice green cabins. And we had a story on the front, it, was, it would be November 2007 or six. I can't remember, um, saying that Her Late Majesty was going to make her first Christmas message in high definition. And the headline on this piece was HRH HD. And I don't often have the vapours, but I was so angry by this. I've identified the problem, but You have, on. because you're a royal expert. Exactly. HRH, it's uh, HM. Of for course it is. Love of God. And when I got God, back... I felt very ignorant in this conversation. Thank you for this. <laughs> when I got back to London a few hours later, I, because, again, I didn't want to humiliate anybody in public, I went to editorial conference, and I took Will Lewis, who was in the editor aside, and I said, are you aware of this absolute horror? And I said, we are going to be deluged with letters from the readers, because the readers are very intelligent mm. people. And like Camilla, of course. And they, <laughs> and, and, and Queen they, Camilla, as she's known. <laughs> well, of course she is. <laughs> to literally no one. And Carry on. they would recognize that this grave solecism. So Will said to me, we've got to stop this. He said, you're now in charge of house style. And so that's when I started to revise the style book. But it's also when I started sending these weekly things. And I mean, you know, like a, all good journalists, we all do it. We all read our paper from cover to cover. Uh, but I was now reading it from cover to cover and making little notes about horrors. And um, to be fair to my colleagues, the, 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 the notes got more and more sporadic and less and less long because they got better and better. Which is encouraging for all of us. Although, did subs ever tap you on the shoulder and say, oh, Simon, you've expressed this like this, but wouldn't it be better said like that? I'm still waiting. <laughs> Good. So basically, these emails at some point or other got leaked and it led to a publishing deal for you to write about language or indeed the bastardization of language and the English language. And your latest book, Scarcely English, an A to Z of assaults on our language, is out now. It's just been published. What are these? What, what are the, when you say our language is under assault, where are these assaults coming from? Well, when I was asked to write this book, which was a couple of years ago, and I was in the middle of writing another book at the time, uh, a big history book, because in my spare time I'm now a professor of history, um, I said to my publisher, but I've done it. I've done two books. I did Strictly English and Simply English 15 and 10 years ago. And he said, oh, but it's getting worse. There are more and more horrors that you didn't catalogue. And so I made a point uh, while I was 
in the year I was spending finishing my last history book to read the newspapers with greater care and to listen out to broadcasts and to uh, read websites. And one of the problems is that so many websites are completely unredacted and people have streams of consciousness <laughs> and just stick things down on websites. And I realized that there were horrors, horrors caused by two things. First, that lack of editorial oversight of so much that is written, but also the growing um, imposition on our culture of Americanisms. Mm. Now that's happened, been happening for over 150 years, but the saturation level of, not so much television these days, but of streaming services, of stuff on the internet. Uh, people now speak instinctively, or younger people in particular, speak fluent American. Uh, so because of the love of cop shows, um, we don't have people going to the witness box in this country anymore. People take the stand. And people don't give evidence, they testify. And it was usually an American accent, of course. And uh, so this book is largely about saying, if language has to change, and I don't for a moment argue it doesn't, it changes because new concepts come along that you have to describe in different ways. But if we've got perfectly good words or phrases, such as going to the witness box, why say take the stand? Simon, tell me why this matters. You know the type of attack you may face, which is that language is organic. Trying to control how language develops is like trying to control the tides. And you, it, some of the critics might say, you can come across as some sort of language Luddite on, a, on an increasingly small bit of land that is being attacked by the world around you. And actually, I would say sadly, but not many people know, young people know who Simon Heffer is. I don't blame them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope this uh, podcast will be final proof that I don't actually speak fluent 1662 prayer book, which <laughs> some people seem to uh, think I do. Of course, language changes. And as I say, you know, we've invented things in the last 40 or 50 years, such as the mobile telephone and the iPad and AI, and they all need language to describe them. And they often borrow things. I mean, when I was a little boy, a tablet was something you took when you were ill. Now it's something that you read a newspaper on. So I, I, I quite un accept that, and that isn't a problem. What annoys me is when there are certain phrases, certain words, which are perfectly useful and do nobody any harm, but people decide because of an external cultural force that they are going to use a different phrase or a different word from the one that's already there. Also, we all, however much pretend to the, to the contrary, we do live in a society where many of us are judged the moment we open our mouths it's not just how we sound, what accent we have or don't have. It's also how articulate or otherwise we are and how we put phrases together. And I used to interview here very bright young people for our graduate trainee scheme. I did that for six or seven years. And a number of them never got as far as an interview. They'd been to very good universities. They'd got very good degrees, but they couldn't spell or they used the wrong preposition they would say, well, it's different to or different than rather than different from. And so I made a judgment about them, which was that they don't speak English as well as somebody who works for the Daily Telegraph or who wants to work for the Daily Telegraph should speak or write English. And I think there is a great handicap for a lot of younger people that they are judged. Not, I mean, very few people want to work for newspapers, but in, in whatever job you're doing, if you're a young person out of university or out of school applying for a job and you are inarticulate and you mangle your language, people will take a view of you and they'll think, well, actually, you know, he or she is a good chap or chapess, but actually they're not quite right for the top job because, you know, they're not very well educated. Having said that, Simon, come on, we always, all of us at times can mangle our language. I was saying in a podcast only the other day that Keir Starmer was a stickler to the rules rather than for the rules, and we didn't edit it out because I only spotted it later. I mean, we all have moments you where we have that, mal malpropisms. <laughs> I haven't resigned on you that. You would have been getting an email from Simon about that. I, was, still I no role. doubt still get an email. <laughs> I think I m used castigated in the wrong uh, phraseology the other day as well. 
OK, we're under the pressure of live broadcasting. We could yeah. change it, but we want it to be free flowing. But I mean, are you really saying that somebody shouldn't work at the Telegraph if, for instance, they confuse, imply and infer? Yes. Or uninterested and disinterested? I, I, I am. I am Flaunt saying that. Flaunt or flout? I am saying that because they will offend our readers. Our readers are a very sophisticated and serious bunch of people. We know that. And it's one reason we like working for the Telegraph, because we're dealing with people who have brains and have discernment. I'm not saying that to suck up to my readers. I love my readers. But it's true. Um, people buy us rather than buy the Daily Star, to name another excellent newspaper, um, because they want the sort of quality journalism that we give them. And I reviewed a book in our paper last um, Saturday, by a very distinguished military historian. It's a very good book uh, on the campaign in Italy in 1944. And he, a military historian, confused the two phrases, the line of fire and the firing line. Now, that is unforgivable because you've only got to be in one or the other to mm. know that there's a very big difference. But do we blame him or his editor? Well, I presume he wrote it and his editor should have corrected it. Simon, take us through some of the things you find most irritating about the way English, British English, which is broadly what we're talking about, has developed. I don't like going into restaurants and hearing people say to waiters, can I get <laughs> steak and chips? Which always makes me, this is about precision in language. When somebody says, can I get steak and chips? I envisage them getting up out of their seat walking into the kitchen and physically fetching it and bringing it back. <laughs> and I just think, hang on. Again, it's somebody who's been watching too many American programmes and who've, who've become mentally American. And what should they say, Simon, would be nicer for them? What could I please have? Or could I order? Or something yes. along, along those lines. So um, that annoys me. Um, oh God, where do I, I don't know where to go. You Camilla, which, like, are, which, are the, well, which are the ones that we, we were discussing which most irritate us? I really dislike the use of impact as a verb. I quite agree. Which is, I find, makes my teeth go slightly mm. on edge. Yes. Also, going forward is another one, rather yes. than in the future. Get, I do, uh, really irritate me. The really obvious one, which everyone still discusses, and of course became famous because supermarkets didn't seem to understand the difference between fewer oh, and yes. less Oh, fewer yeah, items annoying. or less yes. items. It's less than five items. <laughs> yes, yes, was a big thing. Yeah. And I always say, um, well, when my children were a lot younger, it's fewer potatoes, less mash. That's how That's you remember nice the difference between the two of them. Up. You see, your children will all run hedge funds now as a result <laughs> yes. of this brilliant well, upbringing. Because sure I got that. your emails all the time, Simon, <laughs> and I would re relay them back to my children. But you, I mean, you touched on the whole question of corporate mm. speak, um, which is ridiculous. I mean, my editor at uh, Penguin Random House rang me up in a state of astonishment one day about a year ago and said he'd heard about somebody being onboarded. Now this sounded to me like the sort of torture the Americans used to use in Guantanamo <laughs> Bay. But apparently if you're onboarded, you know this as a great business journalist, uh, it means that you have joined the board of a company. And people will say, how's his onboarding going? I mean, this is ludicrous. <laughs> yes. You're also... Um, talking about in the book you're also talking about your dislike for neologisms neologisms how are you pronouncing that Simon? neologism thank you infotainment yes anything with tainment on the end of it, apart okay. from entertainment fun washing yes. i don't even know what that is how about sports washing can we have that well you, you have it whether you like it or not apparently yes it's, it's, it's and, there and you also don't like putting gate on the end of scandals which we did this week because we've talked about Keir Starmer and donations and freebies and called it wardrobe gate. Wardrobe gate. Sponge gate. <laughs> Should we not <laughs> he do is that? He is a fun sponge. <laughs> fun sponge gate. Sometimes yes. you can have joy with language, can't you, uh, Simon, by playing with it. But your point yeah. is slightly different. I mean, look, sadly, I'm old enough to remember Watergate 50 years ago. Uh, and it was 50 years ago. I think we should have. We should have moved on. Mm. Um, but then it's become this easily identifiable thing that if you, I mean, we could have used it too loosely. We, we, we party gate. We're talking about probably too many small scandals and attributing them with the weight of Watergate, which is stupid. Yeah. But how about... I thought party gate, as you call it, was quite a big scandal, actually. Party gate's appropriate. Yeah. So it needs to, it doesn't need to be a bar that a, but a scandal needs to pass in order for it to attract the name Gate. 
Well, I think when I think when people concerned in it are facing criminal charges. Yes. That's pretty serious. All right, there needs to be a degree yes, of criminality. You sort of, you sort of flatten the language, don't you? If you use it too regularly to mean something, you don't have anywhere to go when something actually serious happens. And so yes. it sort of flattens the way we are able to discuss issues and show that some things are more important mm. than others. Take us beyond, though, Simon, the wonderful Telegraph readers... Um, and what they need, but why this actually matters more broadly in terms of the type of country we live in, why language matters. You can go right back to, you know, great SAS and novelist, you know, George Orwell about why language and the way we are precise about language actually matters. We've always borrowed words from other cultures, you know, things like kiosk and curry and, I don't know, <coughs> um, I mean, virtually every word that appeared in our language from the 11th century to the 15th century was of French origin and for the 300 years after that of Latin and Greek origin during the um, Renaissance. So I'm not against borrowing because those lang words that were borrowed were often borrowed to describe things we hadn't described before. Um, I'd, what matters to me is that we are willfully discarding perfectly good words and phrases that work very well, that we all understand, in order to um, almost unwittingly subscribe to the culture of uh, another country, namely America. And uh, it's, it's, I think, unnecessary. We lose a distinctiveness. Uh, what interests me is that when I wrote my first two books, I was attacked by what I would term broadly as a bunch of whining left-wing academics uh, who... This is my kind of people. phraseology. <laughs> um, Got to be honest. Who, you know, earn a great deal of money by patronising people and saying, oh yeah, that's the language of the street. You use that. That's really mm. terrific. When they write in their esteemed publications, whether it's The Guardian or the London Review of Books, they write the most perfect English. Yes of a sort which I find beyond criticism. Yes. So it's one rule for them and one rule for everybody else. And that helps to control people. Mm. Uh, the gift of articulacy, the ability to be able to write well, as people have shown for hundreds of years, is a passport out of poverty, mediocrity, ordinariness. If you've got those superior skills of communication, whether you want to go into politics or writing or whatever else you want to do, management, it gives you a head start. And one reason I think that my book is important is I hope it will teach people, first of all, to continue to speak one of the greatest languages in the world properly in the argo of the mother country, not of America or Australia or any other country that's, that's got English as its main language, but also that it will teach people to think for themselves. When I brought my last book out, I was asked to go to a very good comprehensive school in Suffolk and meet some of the pupils there and talk to them. I was asked to go there by the BBC. The headmaster of the school was very proud of the fact that they were very rigorous about uh, teaching everybody the, uh, the right way to speak English as he saw it. And I was talking to a group of young men. Uh, they were... 16, 17 years old. And uh, one of them said, well, if I use that sort of language when I was out with my mates on a Friday evening, they think there was something wrong with me. And I looked at him, and I wasn't trying to be horrible, a very nice young man. I said, have you ever considered having a mind of your own? <laughs> and he went, uh, because obviously he hadn't. And this is what we're talking about. Mm. We're, we're saying, well, do we just go and speak in the the debased way that more and more people wish to speak? Or do we try and make an attempt to save our mother tongue as it is? And I'm quite keen on doing the latter. And judging from sales of my books, a lot of other people are as well. I will only make the point that my I become the biggest pedant that I can be when people are grammatically inaccurate. So, for instance, when people talk about sending out an invite, it's a verb, it's, it's not a noun, it's an invitation. Or at the weekend, Simon, and I'm not sure if anyone's ever called you this, somebody called me bruv, which is oh. never going to be accurate oh. unless I undergo 
sex change surgery. Um, and I wondered how you would well, how react. Do you, how do you feel when people come up to you and say, if you're with another woman, and say, hi, guys? Yeah. Uh, I hear that all the time. I hear women addressed as a as guy. Yes. Well, I don't know, really. But what I thought I was going to do, actually, I don't know how I feel about being called guys. I mean, I, I think it's I'm... It's another Americanism. I, it's another Americanism. And I, and I do agree with you on can I get a coffee is irritating. What I thought I might do in light of having been called bruv at the weekend is hit you, Simon, with a little bit of Gen Z slang. Do you know the Gen Z, Simon? Are you aware of this I'm about group to learn. of people? Are you about to, are you about, I'm going to hit you with some Gen Z slang. <laughs> and I'm going to see whether you can recognise any of these words. Right. Um, I'm just going to quote my daughter initially. So if I say to you, Simon, it's not that deep, how would you interpret that? Uh, oh, I hope she was looking at a river or something. No, OK. If she says, no, it's calm, how would you... What do you think she's trying to tell me there? Well, I mean, I, um, she, either literally the wind isn't blowing very strongly or <laughs> m or metaphorically, yes. um, everything's going well. If she told me that one of her friends at school had a glow up, what would you think? I think someone had set fire to them. <laughs> if, she, if she turned round to me and said, slay, what would your response be? Um, uh, what you turned to me and said, slay? Yes. I think you're asking me to kill somebody. Right. If I said <laughs> that Kamal had a lot of riz, what would your response be? I think he was in a French restaurant eating <laughs> rice. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Simon, if I said to you, this studio is awesome, no cap, what do you think no cap means? Not was is wearing a hat. Thank you very much, Simon <laughs> Heffer, for that <laughs> insight into Gen Z slang and how senseless it all is, Kamal. Because when my Should teenagers... you just briefly go through what they actually mean, just for Simon's um, No, because I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we do. And you don't want to know. Okay, yes, we do right. Know. Well, let's go through them. CAP is a slang term that originated in the United States and is commonly Where used else? in African American vernacular English. It means to lie or make a. Hang on. Now you're testing me. I just came up with something this idea. Something inaccurate, yeah. It's something it means inverse, something. Yeah. It means something inaccurate. Glow up means when somebody's had a haircut, put on some makeup, and is looking much better than they used to. Right. Slay, Kamal. You explain slay. Slay just means very good. Is that right, Neve? Ish. So it's like terrific, or. You're, 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 well, it, Simon won't understand killing it either. It means you're killing it, Simon, which also doesn't yeah. mean actual killing it. It means you're killing it in the, in the slang sense of believe, you're yeah. looking good. OK. Yeah. Riz, Simon, is an internet slang word defined as style, charm or attractiveness, the ability to attract a romantic or sexual partner. Well, that's Kamal. Time for that is Kamal all over. <laughs> and we also spoke about it's not that deep or the alternative use of that phraseology with a 15 year old would be mum don't deep it and i think it means don't look into this too deeply oh i see it's not too serious and it's oh. not too deep don't worry it's calm apparently means simon there's no need to panic everything's okay i think that one i almost got mm. yes i think the clue is perhaps in is that there particular simon, word is there simon i suppose an approach which people can have different gears for different situations. Well, I course. imagine on the podcast, Simon, I'm, I'm here trying to speak as well as I can in front of, in front of the amazing Mr. And you're Heffer. doing brilliant. No, thank you so I'm much. doing terribly. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> Mr. Heffer. But, but I could understand that, that, that young man you met at the Suffolk Comprehensive School, I look at, I watch you look at my daughter and my son with their friends and they converse very differently from the way they would converse at a sort of in a professional situation and they have some ability to do that in a way that I don't think I was ever really taught. I've always sort of presented in a relatively similar way, whereas they have these gear changes that they're able to manage, which I find quite impressive. I think that's perfectly all right. It's just if you turned up using all the words that Camilla has just educated me about in trying to get a job in the civil service or something like that. Maybe you would get a job in the civil service. <laughs> well, civil service loves a bit of, you know, well, maybe inclusivity nowadays. I think it probably does. Maybe that's the wrong example. Um, I mean, if somebody, if I were giving a job to somebody and he or she turned up and started doing all that, I would just say, well, we're clearly never going to communicate with each mm. other, so thank you and good night. Can we discuss our favourite words? Simon, do you have a favourite word in the English language? Holiday. <laughs> Kamal, put you on the spot now. You have put me on the spot, actually. I know what mine is. Go on, tell us yours. 
gobbledygook. It's a great word. Is it a proper word, word, Simon? You're going to no, tell me is. that that's a bad word. I mean, there are all sorts of words like anti dis disestablishment arianism. Yes. Um, flocky now in hilly pilification. Love My that one. Me. What does that even mean? Uh, I used to know when I was doing <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, Deoxyribose nucleic acid. That's just the name what of DNA. <laughs> but it sounds nice, doesn't it? What about otorhinolaryngological? That's a really good one. Wow, what does that mean? Ear, nose and throat. That's brilliant. If somebody comes up to you to drink sparkling and says, I'm an otorhinolaryngological specialist, yeah, that's, that's what he or she does. Love that. Mm. Oh, Kamal, wonderful. You I don't really have yet? a favourite. No, I'm afraid I don't. The only first thing that came to my head when you said that, which is rather odd, is spatula. That is a good word, though. I do though. like that word. It is a good so word. I, mean, I, I presume there are children watching this podcast and listening to it, and so there are a number of words which I find amusing, but I think before the watershed, we probably better stay clear of them. And finally, Simon. No, Simon, we can't no, let no, that no, drop. No, Hold on. Simon, Simon, we can't let that drop. Sorry. Go on, give us one of those. A little bit rude. Uh, listeners, well, be I, ready. I, I've always found moist rather amusing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I we thought were... you were going to say spank or. <laughs> no, I, I tell you what is a good word slapstick. <laughs> we could get like this. Onomatopoeic so is a good word. That's a good word. Crankshaft. Um, crankshaft. You're getting yes. a bit now snarp snarp, aren't we? We are getting slightly snarp up. The other thing I was going to ask Simon is who do you think, uh, should we confine it to politics, who has impressed you with their language skills in Parliament in recent years? Any of the Prime Ministers? Do you like the way that Keir Starmer speaks? No, I think he sounds like a robot. Mm. Um, presumably no one's paid for his English lessons, so he, that's why he doesn't speak very well. Um, who, that was a joke by the way. <laughs> um, the last really brilliant speaker in the House of Commons in terms of fabulous English was Michael Foote. Um, Michael Foote, Enoch Powell, Dennis Healy, I mean a generation all educated in the 30s, were absolutely brilliant speakers of English. And if you go back and read their speeches, they speak in sentences and paragraphs. Mm. And there's no ooming and ooming. And I know Hansard cleans things up, but you can always tell a real, really bogus speaker. But would somebody like Jacob Rees-Mogg be a latter-day... Well, does he speak well, or is he just a sort of parody of himself? I think dear Jacob's a parody of himself. Um, it's, it's not so much how he says it, it's what he says, which is a problem. Um, I don't know of anybody recently... You know, I wouldn't be asking the Dean Dorries to give me English lessons if I were a foreigner. No. How about Boris Johnson, though? His written English. I mean, he has, I would say, a wide and varied lexicon with words in it that he has used in speeches that the so-called common man might not immediately recognise. He has got quite a wide vocabulary. Well, he allegedly studied Latin and Greek at school, I think. So, yes, he has got a wide vocabulary. Um, he's a person I find it in absolutely impossible to take seriously. Mm. So, um, and I don't ever remember him making a tremendous speech, largely because whenever he did make a speech, he had never prepared for it. It was all off the cuff. He was always winging it. On the occasions I saw him make a speech, I remember being present when he was shouted down when he was a higher education spokesman for the Conservative Party. He just turned up and started to tell jokes. Um, and the very serious people who've gone to a conference to hear him were deeply unimpressed. So uh, I'm sure if he actually sat down and wrote a speech, he could give a very good one. Does, does it, is it a problem that he might use words that other people don't understand? No, because that's what dictionaries are there for. Simon, give us a summary of the book, the big message of the book and why it matters. The message of the book is I think that British English is rather a precious but endangered species. And I fear there is a tremendous attempt to impose the cultural norms of particularly America on it. It's not just Americanisms. There are people who make mistakes and they're not corrected. I mean, one of the great horrors of last year, it was in February last year, I called up a website of a rival newspaper and read that King Charles was going to be coronated on the 6th of May. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Come um, now. 
No, if you... That's I, impacted me, the awfulness of that. <laughs> well, I, I, I bet it has, and it was say, not somebody who works with this newspaper. Um, but I went to the OED. I've got an OED at home. Everyone should have one. I went to the OED and got out the volume for C, and Coronated had indeed been used in the past, but not, I think, since about 1650. Mm. So you can either say there's a really brilliant person who has resurrected a word after 400 years nearly and stuck it in the English language, or a complete twerp who doesn't know that the verb to crown is the verb that is related to a coronation. It's a good verb. Funny enough, it's the royals that like to use the word impactful. What the Princess of Wales has done on early years learning is very impactful, I was often told back in the day. So it's had a very serious impact. Apparently so. Yes, it is effective. You see, I've never seen the point of chucking away words that are perfectly useful and that do the job that they were designed to do. And I don't see why they should be replaced. So either I don't see why coronated to replace crown. I mean, luckily, we won't have another coronation for a few years. And perhaps by the time it comes, that horror will have been well and truly uh, stamped out. But these American things, we've resisted some of them. I've yet to hear anybody say, I must stand in line. Um, Ooh, yes, instead of queue. Mm. I think the day the British abandon the word queue is the day that we all pack up and go home. Well, I, think that would, I think that would be a great moment. But this morning I was coming here on a train and I was waiting for um, the tube at Liverpool Street Station and the announcer said that we were not to go near the tube that was coming in until it had got to the platform and made a full stop. <laughs> and I then thought to myself, how does a train make a semicolon. <laughs> or a partial stop. <laughs> or a par yeah, Well, uh, that that's probably is a semicolon. Uh, or a colon. Mm. Uh, why a full stop? And we've also got to say to now, uh, prepositions go all over the place. My train always arrives into Liverpool Street Station. I thought it arrived at Liverpool Street Station. Yes. Also, I, I must admit, until I read you did a wonderful article in The Telegraph about uh, your new book, I'd slightly forgotten that we have railway stations in Britain and not train, not train stations. stations. And I must admit, I need to go back to railway station now, Simon. You've pointed out my error. To think we haven't even got on to football punditry. We haven't yet. And how people look fantastic. He played fantastic, which I'm sure irritates you. The death of the you. adverb. Yes, the death of the adverb. The adverb is dying. Um, we also have got on to like. Oh, like? What do you mean, as a kind of punctuation mark? Well, it's the way it's, it's, the way it's replaced... Um, quotation marks. Yes. So I might say, Camilla said to me that um, she was going to have lunch after we'd done this podcast. And a younger generation would say, Camilla was like, I'm going to have lunch after this podcast. <laughs> yes, that's it. That is it. And that's what they do. Where the hell did that come from? Mm. America. That's right. America. It and we probably can blame the Americans for, you know. Oh, I didn't know about that. I think that's been going on a very long time. Simon Heffer, Scarcely English, an A to Z of Assaults on Our Language, is published now. Get it from all good bookshops and improve the way you speak and write. I'm going to be back tomorrow with another Telegraph veteran and great Lord Moore, oh. Charles Moore, former editor of the Daily Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph, to discuss the future of the right and... What Margaret Thatcher, as he was her authorised biographer, might think of the current crop of Tory leadership candidates. Join us tomorrow, 5pm.